Well, welcome to the Genealogy Collective. Our collective comprises of six North Shore libraries, Bayville, Glen Cove, Gold Coast, Locust Valley, Manhasset, and Oyster Bay. Together, we offer monthly genealogy programs. Um, tonight's program, Advanced Genealogy Research, is sponsored by Oyster Bay, East Norwich Public Library, and our presenter today is Tina Baird. Tina is a local history librarian and owner of Tamarack Genealogy in Oswego, Illinois. As a member of the Genealogical Speakers Guild and the Association of Professional Genealogists, um, Tina lectures extensively on topics including military research, Scottish genealogy resources, and archival preservation. She serves on the board of directors for the Illinois State Historical Records Advisory Board, the Illinois State Genealogical Society, and the Northern Illinois Historic League and the Oswego um, Heritage Association. She has been researching her family history as um, time permits for over 25 years. She's a rabid baseball fan. Tina has visited 24 of the 30 major league baseball ballparks across the country. Um, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Tina. Thank you so much. It is a delight to be on with all of you today, and thank you for tuning in. Um, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about advanced genealogy topics, but some of the resources are going to seem pretty mundane. You're going to think, but we've used newspapers and we've used city directories before. But what I want you to think about is not only resources you might not have tapped in your genealogy before, but resources that you've used, but never thought to use those resources in this particular way. So throughout the course of the talk, I'm going to talk about resources you've probably used at one time or another um, and try to couple that with new ideas and maybe some new ways in which to utilize those and add them to your genealogy. So in an effort to avoid bandwidth issues and how much I talk with my hands so you don't see my little bobbing head in your upper right hand corner and so you can see my full screen because I've got a lot of images that are going to go corner to corner I'm going to turn my camera off um, but I will turn it back on when we get to the question and answer period um, so let's take it away give me just a second all righty so I'm going to talk about resources like land records, I'm gonna talk about resources like city directories, like I said, um, that you've probably used pretty frequently um, in your research. But what I want you to think about is expanding your understanding of land records and expanding your understanding of some of these resources to really you know, dive deeper and get more out of um, every last little grain that you can out of these resources. So for most of us, most of our ancestors own land at one time or another. Um, for those of us who didn't, I do have some family who lived in urban areas or who were tenant farmers who never physically owned the land themselves. There's still ways to get at information about them. There's still research that can be done that relates to land that we can pull out and that we can tease and use to our advantage. Um, so things like regional maps and land descriptions are things that we might have a tendency to not use to their fullest. I'm going to show you an example in a minute, but I'm going to talk about a map um, that at the end, when we get to the q and I want to cut and paste the link and, and put it in the chat for you to take a look at. Um, we have a tendency in the late 20th and early 21st century to think of land um, cadastrally. So basically what cadastral maps are, are maps that have boundaries, hard and fast boundaries. That can be a county map, that can be a township map, that could be a city map. Cemetery maps would be considered cadastral maps because they reference um, spe specific hard and fast boundaries. But sometimes we want to look a little broader. We want to look at more regional maps and more maps that are related to territory than to a specific designated space. Um, and the reason why we want to do that is because the further back we go with our research, uh, research, when you start getting back to colonial era, if you're lucky enough, things weren't done by county. Things weren't done by city. Things were done by geographic area. So, for example, you know, I wouldn't necessarily look for a map for Washington County, Pennsylvania. I would look for maps on the Junietta Valley. Or I wouldn't look for a map on um, Armantrout, West Virginia. I would look for something like the Cowpens Valley. 
And the reason you do that is because they're going to incorporate a larger area. They're going to be um, easier to find because you're predating counties. So if I'm looking for a county map and there's no county that exists at that time, I'm going to come up empty in my search. Um, but you also want to look at regional maps because you want to understand a wider scope than just your little city, your little municipality, your township, your your um, your county. So I'm going to talk about those maps in just a second. I'm going to show you a couple of examples. And then land descriptions. You know, we think of land as being, you know, feet and inches or meets and bounds, but land descriptions can be pretty interesting the further back you go. So instead of telling me that it's, you know, 26 rods to the north and three chains and then 14 rods to the east and two chains, sometimes early land maps are listed by the descriptors of the people who surround them. So it's telling me that this boundary runs along the John Craig farm and the boundary boundary on the rest on the left, the east side runs along the James McClure farm, right? No physical description. It's not giving me meets and bounds. It's not giving me rods and, and chains. It's giving me people. And that's the piece that we're looking for. We're trying to find people, right? So whether my person owned land directly and I'm looking for their specific land record, or I'm just looking for a reference to them from somebody near them, these regional maps and land descriptions can provide those kinds of things. Things like federal land patents and warrants. Somebody serves in the military and they're provided a patent for their service instead of a pension or pay. There were very specific designated areas in which those patents and warrants could be redeemed. Think of um, the Western Reserve land in Ohio. Here in Illinois, Western Illinois, between the Mississippi and Illinois River, which includes things like Alexander County, Whiteside County, Joe Davies County, were all set aside specifically as military land. So you're going to be looking for things like that. And you might not have thought. You might think, oh, I have family that moved to Alexander County, Illinois in 1826. Boy, that's super early. But why did they move to Alexander? Alexander was, was, that, was within that military land zone. So if I find a sale that takes place in that area, my first question is going to be, did they serve? And this was a script that they were given to purchase land as a thank you for their service. So you want to try to look at things in a different way. We're familiar with deeds. And we may be familiar with mortgages, but what about dowers' rights? Up until the Civil War, a woman could own property if she was single, but as soon as she became married, then her property became the right of her husband in a lot of states. So if he wanted to sell that property, she was automatically entitled to a third of that land. And then the children would be eligible for a third of that land as well. So in order for him to sell the property, she had to go separately and apart from her husband. I'm going to show you an example of that, saying that, yes, I know about the sale. Yes, I approve of the sale. And she would get her portion. If she disagreed, if she didn't know about it, then they could actually cancel the land sale. So Dower's rights books aren't always filed together with deeds. Sometimes you have to dig a little deeper. And then back to that whole concept of thinking outside of our 20th and 21st century mindset. In the 21st century, I buy a piece of property. I take out a deed. I'm taking out a mortgage because I need to borrow the money in order to pay for the property. That wasn't typically the case. You could take out a mortgage on a property um, and pay for it separately than the price you paid for the land itself, right? Or mortgages typically referred to renters. So if I'm looking for somebody who was a tenant farmer who might have been living in an area for a couple of years before he found just the right piece of property that he wanted to buy, he's going to be renting and he's going to be renting from somebody else. So looking through mortgage books might be might predate the very first deed that you find for one of your ancestors. So you want to be looking for these types of records as well. Some places where you can go, Bureau of Land Management is a wonderful place where you can go to find information, especially about um, land records sold from the federal government. So whether that's a homestead application, whether that's military land, whether that was indigenous people's land that were sold 
opened up and sold. Um, there are all kinds of different reasons for why land becomes available um, and sold by the federal government. And when you go into the Bureau of Land Management's website, you have the ability to narrow down by the type of record it is. So yes, you could do a general search and you could just search by location or by name, but you can also go in and tell it, I just want to look at homestead records. I just want to look at Florida indigenous records. I just want to look at military land patents. And you can narrow your search in that way too. You are incredibly lucky on the East Coast that you have such fantastic land records that go back to colonial times. So New York State Archives has a really good finding aid on their website on how to drill into those records. New Jersey has a lot of theirs already digitized as indexes that are available online. Same thing with Pennsylvania has made records all the way back to colonial times available for your research online as well. Another fantastic place to look for land records is the Library of Congress. And I was talking a little bit earlier as some of you were coming in. Library of Congress is one of my absolute favorite resources. Um, and the reason why it's one of my favorite resources is just because of the, the breadth and the depth and the scope of their collections. So people don't realize that the Library of Congress is a public library. It is the people's library. It is open to anybody who is a U.S. citizen to go into the Library of Congress, receive a library card, and take advantage of all of the amazing things that they have to offer. I'm not going to get on my soapbox and go on and on about all the wonderful things that they have to offer, but what I do want to talk about is their map collection. So throughout the course of today, when I talk about city directories, when I talk about maps when I talk about county histories, Library of Congress has all of these things and they have them available remotely for free from home. So if you haven't used Library of Congress for their maps or for their city directory collection and phone book collection or for their county histories and map, um, their county histories and atlases collections, then you're missing an opportunity to deepen your research. But one particular map that I was talking about earlier there is a French map that was created during the Revolutionary War for the French army to keep track of where troops were in the Williamsburg area. So this was Williamsburg, this was Yorktown, this is Jamestown, where different troops are located. And the reason why I geeked out so hardcore over this map was when you zoom into it, it tells you where the French troops are, where the British troops are, where the colonial troops are, are quartered. But it's also showing you individual families and properties. It's showing me where the Custis Farm is and where the Johnson Mill is and where all of these individual people are living who are being impacted by this major life event, this world-changing military engagement. And this is true for a lot of places across the country. So if you're doing research and you have family in the South, whether it's, you know, Missouri, whether it's um, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Virginia, whether it's the Northeast, whether it's New Hampshire and Connecticut and New York, there were military engagements that took place in those areas that impacted those families that lived in those communities. So using the Library of Congress's maps collection, especially their military maps collection, can provide you a lot of information and some visual examples of where your family might've been living. Think about the War of 1812 and about the Battle of Lake Champlain and everything that was going on in upstate New York and in New Hampshire and Vermont at the time. There are maps for those that are digitized and available online. Or if you had, people in your family who were impacted by Sherman's March to the Sea during the Civil War. There are maps available online to kind of show you and pinpoint how and where your family might have been impacted. Plus, even if your family wasn't impacted, these maps are a tremendous resource to use in your collections, and they're available to you for free just by going to the Library of Congress's website. Um, so I'm a huge proponent of all of the things that they have to offer. I and mean, then when it comes to land records, particularly in, in maps and plats, they really are the easiest resource to access. So I always try to throw in at least one resource that's not on your handout, because if you're taking the time to be here with me today, I want to give you a little bit of extra um, that the person who's just going to download the handout isn't going to get. And that would be ArchiveGrid. 
So if you watched my previous presentation that I provided for you back in October, I talked a lot about how to use archives in your research, specifically how to use archives from museums and, and universities and historical societies. Archive Grid is the way to find what you don't know. How do I know what I don't know? Archive Grid is out there to tell me what I don't know. So I can go into Archive Grid and I can do a search on a person. I can do a search on a place. I can do a search on a subject. And it's going to bring up records all across the country of special collections and, and museum collections and library collections that are pertinent to that topic. So for example, I have a son that goes to school at Madai University in Buffalo, New York. I might want to know a little bit more about the founding of Madai University in 1952. So I could go into Archive Grid and I can type in Madai, and it was college up until this year, and see what comes up. Or I might want to research my grand, my great grandfather George Middleton. I can put George Middleton in, and it's going to tell me where he shows up all across the country. So it helps me find those places and those things that I didn't even know existed. And for land records, that's hugely important, right? It can help me find you know, maybe those Torrens or those chain of titles or those maps or those dower books just by going in and, and using a variety of search terms to try to discover that. So I'm throwing that out to you now. If you haven't watched that talk, please go go back and watch it. I think you'd benefit from it. Um, but Archives Grid is one of my favorite resources for finding what I don't know. So now let's talk about examples. This record is for a piece of property that a female owned. This is Jane McClure, who her name is spelled three different ways in the same document. Um, not a whole lot of attention to detail. Spelling was really just kind of a bonus. Um, but this document predates the Revolutionary War, predates statehood. So this record is from February of 1768. And it's showing the boundaries of the piece of property that she owns. And if I look at this map, it's telling me that to her west is James Knox's property and that to her east is James McClure, her older brother's property, and that the land immediately to her northwest is vacant. There's nobody on that piece of property. Same thing with the property to her north. So those names, I might not have been looking for James McClure, but now I know that, that he's her next door neighbor. And I'm going to go looking for information about him now. But these are those records where there's no hard and fast boundary. I mean, it does give me dimensions. It does tell me how many feet it happens to be. But when I when I say, you know, it's not giving me, you know, hard and fast boundaries, there's no county, really. It's Craven County, which is enormous. It includes what eventually becomes North and South Carolina. Not really all that helpful. Um, but it tells me that it's on Rocky Creek. And like I said, you know, they're not talking about Washington County. They're talking about the Juniata Valley. So, you know, you want to make sure as you're doing this research, you have a general idea of what does the lay of the land look like? What did they call it? What historically, when I'm searching through, you know, settler histories and, and pioneer histories and diaries and letters, what did they call it? That's what I'm going to be looking for. So just doing a search on Rocky Creek or just doing a search on Fishing Creek, which is another creek that the family lived on, brings up a lot of information that gets lost when you start looking for county, township, city. So this is a great map. I love these simply for the fact that she's the one that owns property registered um, to England because this is we're still part of, of England at the time. Um, and it's showing me who all of her neighbors are. Here's another example of a record. This is also the Eastern Seaboard. This is um, North Carolina. But look at all the individual family names that are listed on this map. And look at all the women that are on this map. You know, you have, you know, Mrs. Lizzie Paddow at the top. You have Mrs. McKendrick. You have Mrs. E. Fowler. You have Mrs. B. Syme. Miss Syme, who's listed on this map. Lots and lots and lots of women. Too often, we have a tendency to think, oh, I'm not going to find anything for women. They weren't allowed to own property. I'm going to look for I'm going to look for the husband or the father. Yes, it's fair. That's useful. But don't think that there's not going to be anything. And maps like this, these regional maps really show you all of those places where women are still a very active part of the community and they're being represented alongside their male neighbors. You have Mrs. Stenhouse listed on this map as well. So regional maps can offer you a very unique perspective. What it also offers you is the fact that it shows you why do communities grow? Why do they shift? Why do they evolve 
in one direction or another. When we look at the bottom of this map, there are wide swaths of territory where nobody's living there. Why is nobody living there? Because you have to come all the way up past Cedar Falls to ford the river or to fork shoals to, to ford the river. So nobody's down at the bottom because there's not a way to get there. There's not a way to ford the river easily. You have to go up and around and it's tremendously inconvenient. So you see people are congregating in areas that are easy to get to than some of the more remote places that are harder to reach. Here's one of those dower rights that I was talking about. In the middle there, I highlighted it. It says, you know, the said Mary Turner, wife of said James M. Turner, having been, you know, made acquainted with the contents of the deed and being examined separate and apart from her said husband, acknowledges that she has, you know, executed the same, that she agrees to relinquish her rights to the, to the piece of property so that the property can be sold. And the date on this is in Illinois, and it's in 1844. Look for these types of records. Don't just think I'm looking for a deed. Look for these other types of things too, because you might be surprised at some of the records that you find. Now, in our area of the country, everything is based on the township system where you are, you're going to be talking to the town clerk or you're going to be talking to the town historian, but the types of records that are collected are going to be virtually the same. So highway commissioners records, road districts, Anybody who has anything to do with the grading and repair and maintenance of roads and bridges are going to have information that's going to be pertinent to you when it comes to dealing with land records. Things like the Justice of the Peace is going to be responsible for things like chattel mortgages. And if you've never heard the term chattel mortgage before, what that means is I need to borrow money to either buy property or to pay off debt or to buy a cow. So I'm going to put up collateral against the money that I'm borrowing. So if I borrow $100 from John Thompson, what am I using that's valued at $100? So if I don't pay my debt back on time, he then is able to take possession of. Chattel mortgages are absolutely fascinating because they give you a very succinct socioeconomic um, impression of your family in the community. Usually the wealthiest people are the ones that are lending the money. They're setting the interest rate, typically 10%. I love the people who only charge six. God love them. But I'm putting up two cows with descriptions and even names. Sometimes they'll tell you the names of the cows. One has a star on its forehead. One has a red spot on its foot. I'm putting up you know, 10 acres of corn or four bushels of wheat or whatever it happens to be so that I can borrow that money. And you'll see repeat offenders. You'll pe see people who are constantly borrowing money, the old adage of robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of thing, and let you know right away, this family member is not, not very successful, um, that they're really struggling to make ends meet because they're constantly borrowing money and repaying money. But within those Justice of the Peace records, you're going to find those chattel mortgages, which can be really, really insightful. And they'll also describe the property as well if they're putting property up as collateral. Justice of the Peace is also responsible for records that that is kind of a stopgap measure before having to go to court, to county court. So those are things like fence line disputes, um, astrays, somebody's cow wanders into your yard and eats all of your cabbages and you're filing a complaint against the, the cow owner. Those types of things show up in Justice of the Peace records. Um, so while they're typically court records, they're not criminal court. They're not, it's more like small claims court, um, but they could be really insightful. So checking to see if your town historian, if the clerk or if your township offices still have these things like school reports, censuses and, and class registers, tax assessors. My grandma Nelly, God love her, always says two things in life you can never get out of and that's death and taxes. You pay taxes on multiple levels. So the information collected by each of those tax assessors might be slightly different. Um, so you wanna make sure if it's a town, you're looking at the town tax. If it's a county, you're looking at the county tax to see what they were collecting for each individual person. This isn't just landowners. If I was a, a tenant farmer and I was renting property, I would still have to pay on my personal property. So that would be carriages and wagons, that would be sewing machines, that would be clocks and watches, that would be my dog, 
in Illinois, they charged a tax if you had a dog. Um, so lots of things would get taxed, hogs and sheep and horses and things like that. So as a tenant farmer, I'm not paying tax on the property itself because I don't own it, but I am paying taxes on everything that's in it and on it. So you want to be looking for those types of records as well. I apologize. My dog Dodger is howling. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I don't know what set him off, but I apologize. Um, things like voters lists and tax lists are things you want to look for as well, um, because voters lists could be pretty insightful as well. So especially when you're dealing with early records, right, you had to be certain things in order to be eligible to vote. You had to make sure that you were a white male over the age of 21 who was a property owner. Um, that didn't change until um, the uh 17th Amendment changed and you were uh, African-Americans. Males were then allowed to vote. Women didn't get the right to vote until, you know, the 19th Amendment. So voters lists can be really insightful and indicative of the, the time, too. So you want to make sure that you please um, take a look for these records as you're doing research as well. So a couple of examples. This one's a poll tax book. And I just love the fact that the person who put the record together didn't spell poll correctly. It's not a pool book. They're not selling swimming pools. They're not playing pool. This is just a, a, a spelling error. But it shows me all of the people who paid that tax in order to be eligible to vote. And again, when you look at the names, Charles, Henry, John, William, Ashby, you know, Dennis, again, we're talking about white males at this particular moment in time. But this is 1861. Here's an example of one of those property tax records where this is the personal property. So the renter, if you're still an owner, yes, you're going to pay real estate tax and you're going to pay personal tax. It's just the renters who are not going to be obligated for that real estate tax. But you could see that you're being charged on the number of sheep, on the number of hogs, on the number of carriages or wagons that you happen to own. And that runs across the board. So these types of records are usually harder to come by. Um, Sometimes you have to reach out to the institution. They're not digitized and available online in a lot of instances. If they no longer have the records in-house, they should be able to tell you where they went, where they donated to the local historical society, um, or were they given to the state archives or state library. Um, but they're really, really interesting. And the reason why they're so beneficial is because they're every year, every year you are paying this tax. So instead of waiting for the decennial census and having to wait 10 years, you can look for these records for communities where a city directory doesn't exist. When you're dealing with rural areas that are heavily farmed, you're not going to find a city directory necessarily to rely on. So having access to these tax records can be really, really helpful. I talked a little bit briefly about school district records. Um, in Illinois, for example, the school district system was designed in 18, 1847. So the very first school year, official school year um, by the state was 1848. Um, so this is the creation of that particular district, and the people had to vote in the community on whether or not they were going to agree to pay the tax to pay into to create the school district. In Illinois at the time, you needed to have 10 students in order to have a viable school district. So you needed to make sure and conduct a census of school-age children to find out whether or not you were going to have enough to actually have a school district to then have to pay taxes for. And what's fascinating about these types of records is in Illinois specifically, births and deaths didn't begin being recorded by the state until 1877. And at that point, it was just requested, not required until 1914. So having access to school censuses and schedules starting in 1848, that's nearly 30 years before the state starts asking for birth and death information. So you can find students listed on these records if they existed for your area that could predate state vital records or even community vital records. Um, so they're really, they're really, really insightful. They're a lot harder to find, but if you can find them, they're just pure gold. Um, here's an example of one. This one's from 1857. Like I said, you needed to have 10 students in our area in order to have a viable school district. So you could see 46464410 four, 
I assure you, William Saring was one year old because on the 1860 census, he's listed as being four. So I can guarantee you he never attended school. They just needed one extra child so that they could create this particular school district for the year. Um, the beauty of these records is sometimes they'll give you ages, sometimes they'll give you exact birth dates, it just depends on where on the country in the country you're doing your research. So for example, in Kansas and Nebraska, the state didn't start requiring births until 1910 and 1911, respectively, but you can find school census records that go back into the 1890s and 1880s in some places, long before the state mandates the recording of person deaths. What's about school census records is the fact that it was children of school age. And as you can see on this document, they considered children to be of school age from the age of four to the age of 20. So even if you were long past what we would deem to be school age today, you would still show up on these census lists. I have one family in Nebraska, in Wahoo, Nebraska, where mother and child show up on the same school census because she's 21 and the child is five. And they're both listed under her husband, who's listed as the head of household. So sometimes you find some really amazing things for people who aren't technically in school, but are of that age that show up in these records. Here's another one of those voter lists. I showed you the poll tax list. This is a voter list for my community in Plainfield. This is 1850, and it's showing me all of the men who were eligible to vote in that particular election in April of 1850. And it's two pages. This is just a screenshot of the top of it, but it shows me the people who were um, voting for the local township ballot. There's a really robust collection of voters records online for the New Orleans area. So if you're doing research in Louisiana, there's lots of voters, voters list records out there. There's a lot of poll tax and um, they used to do uh, like reading tests, poll um, tests um, to make sure people could read in order to vote. Those records are available for Louisiana as well. Newspapers, I don't think there's a single one of us who are online who's never used newspapers in your research. But what I want you to think about in newspapers is those, those places we have a, a tendency to skip right past because we want to get to what we think of as the juicy stuff. Like obits are on page eight, so I'm just going to fast forward the microfilm reel to page eight because that's where all the good stuff is. But here's some examples of all of the other amazing things that could talk about your family as well. Things like court records, right? things like probates, land sales, name changes, divorces, adoptions, all of those things show up in the column that every week or every day, the newspaper would run about what's going on at the community court, at the county courthouse. Things like personal and real estate tax lists. So I showed you what the tax list looked like from the tax assessor, but they always ran that inventory in the local paper typically twice a year. You'd run the real estate and personal taxes in April, and then in August was the list of all of the delinquents who hadn't paid their taxes yet. I love the delinquent tax list. My family's always on the delinquent tax list. Things like WAN ads and business directories, we have a tendency to skip those columns on the far left side because we're rushing to look for, you know, car accident accounts and, and deadly shootings. Juan adds people who are looking for help. They're looking to hire farmhands. They're looking to hire servants. They're looking to hire, you know, a nanny or somebody to attend to the children. Gives you a lot of social, socioeconomic information. Um, those business directories, those um, columns where the attorneys and the tax preparers and the um, justice of the pieces are hocking their wares. Those are important too. So don't just rush right to the what you think are the juicy parts, make sure you're looking at other things too. School happenings, most newspapers are reporting on what's going on in the schools. In our community, we were lucky enough that the school had its own newspaper. And then when their paper came out, the local newspaper would harvest information out of it and run its own column in the local newspaper. And this is an example of one of those. This was from October of 1953 talking about the class that had graduated in June of 1953. And while I realize it's hard to see on your screen, it's listing all of the women who have gotten married in the four months since they graduated from school. You know, it's telling me that Rhonda Countryman is now Mrs. John Weber, that Concerto Cucci is now Mrs. Vincent Manfredini, that Eudora Bielhofer is now Mrs. George Manfredini, Verdell Fairweather is now Mrs. Martin Old, 
Here's a good one. Helen Foran is now employed as a stenographer for Stone and Webster. It's giving me their occupations if they've become school teachers. You know, Emerald Lance is now teaching school at Spam Spangler School. This is four months. If I don't have a date as to exactly when somebody gets married or, you know, I don't know what they did once they got out of school, coming across an article like this is really, really insightful because now I know Dorothy Hacker is now Mrs. Walter Newman. So going forward, I'm going to be looking for Dorothy Newman or let's look up Stone and Webster and find out where they were and how far it was from where she lived and see if I can find any employment records or business um, accounts about that business. Sporting events and rosters, you know, students who are track stars, homecoming, football games. Did you were you lucky enough that you had somebody in your family who played in a beer league or on a bowling team, you know, who was a member of the community chess club? All of that stuff is going to show up in the papers, and it can all be useful. You might think that oh, it's just extra; it's not important. But sometimes you're going to find a gem in there. And always remember, search for nicknames. If you searched for me under my given name, you would rarely find me in the newspaper. But if you search for me under Tina, then you're absolutely going to find me. Or people who had nicknames, Shorty, Lefty, Lucky, Bunk, whatever it happens to be. That's how they're going to be listed in the newspaper. My, gram my great grandmother, when her mother died and they ran an obit for her, my great grandmother, who I had always known as Catherine, because in vital records and government records. Her name is Catherine. In her mother's obituary, she was listed as Kitty. And I laughed for a good five minutes because in my head, you know, Catherine is, you know, a very, you know, strong and and mature name. And to find out that her family called her tick called her Kitty just absolutely tickled me. So nicknames are something you want to make sure you're looking for as well. This is one of my favorite finds of all time. So in our community, homecoming is the biggest event of the year, and it brings in thousands of people to watch the parade in the football game. Well, every year at homecoming, they celebrate what's called the 50th anniversary class. So this year, let this sink in, we're celebrating the 50th year class, which is 1973. If that hurts any of you as much as it hurts me, you're going to understand why. Um, but this particular year in 1960, they were honoring the class of 1910. And at the time, nobody could find a photo of the class of 1910. The only photo they could find was their first grade photo from 1899. So they ran that photo in the paper talking about the 50th anniversary class of 1910. And the beauty of this is that every single child in that photo is listed in this article. And what's even more impressive are that three of the children had already passed away by this point. And the entire graduating class of 1910 only had 11 students. So two thirds of the children in this photo never graduated from Plainfield Township High School. They might've moved away. They might've dropped out to go to work or get married or join the service. But here they all are in their adorable first grade glory being celebrated 51 years, 61 years after this particular photo was taken. So when you're utilizing newspapers, it is so imperative to not stop at the date of death of the person. Because if I had done that, I would have missed this gorgeous little gem for several of these children. Also, you don't ever wanna stop at the date of death because there might be an obituary for a spouse or a child. There might be some other mention of that person um, after their death. Almost every community has a back in the day column, 20 years, 25 years, 50 years, 75 years that reruns articles that took place that week, 75 years ago, that would be the perfect opportunity to find some of these, these um, hidden gems as you're doing your research. So newspapers can have a lot more than I'm looking for the marriage announcement, I'm looking for the birth announcement, and I'm looking for the obit. There's a lot of living that takes place in between. Here's some examples of those delinquent tax lists, mortgage sales, farm sales, sheriff sales, somebody doesn't pay their taxes, their home is foreclosed on, and the piece of property is put up for sale through the, the sheriff's office, those are all going to show up in the newspaper. So you're going to want to be looking for those things too. And they're telling me exactly where the property is. If it's a farm outside of town, it's telling me the section, the township, the section, and the range. If it's a property within town, it's telling me the lot, the block, and the house number. So 
lots of great information to then go back and look for this individual property in town or near town. People think that adoptions are sealed, so I'm, there's no point in looking because there's not going to be anything available. Historically, adoptions were public records, and they would show up in the courthouse column in the local paper, just like anything else, just like any type of um, land sale probate record, anything like that. So here's a couple of examples, or here's an example for you. This is 1947, and it's giving me the name of the child. As, so I have his original birth name, as well as the name of his parents who are adopting him. Right. So use it. Look for it. If you're looking for adoptions, newspapers are the places to go. I have records from 1871 all the way up to 1961 that show up in the local newspapers. So, you know, this idea that all oh, these are sealed because they're sealed now. They weren't sealed then. So it's worth it to go and look for it. Another example for you, if I'm a tenant farmer, I wouldn't move during the planting season. I would move in the off season. So I wouldn't move once my crops are planted until crops are harvested. So people would typically all move within a community on one day, usually February 1st or March 1st. So in this particular article, it's telling me all of the people who are changing properties, all of those renters who are now moving from one piece to the next. And the beauty is this is not an Illinois thing. This is not a Midwest thing. I've seen moving day articles across the country. So February 1st to March 1st saves you time from trying to figure out when they moved from one farm to another. You've got a window, a month's window to go through the newspapers to see what you can find. And they didn't do it piecemeal because if I'm waiting for the property that I'm moving into to be vacated, the person waiting for mine can't move in. That's why everybody did it on the same day so that Olin Keene could move into the, you know, uh, J.E. Bressler could move into the Olin Keene house on Fox River Street so that Frank Gilbert could move into the Heron house on Joliet Road so that those properties were vacated so that people could finish that moving jigsaw puzzle as it was every year. So city directories, again, they're things that we use all the time. I just want you to think about all of the extras that a city directory provides outside of just the name of your ancestor living at a particular address. Sometimes you have names that are frequently misspelled. My maiden name is Tatara. T-A-T-A-R-A. -A -A. Easy. It's like Canada, only not quite as nice. Spelled eight different ways in the local city directory. Spelled with two T's, two R's, E-A, all kinds of different ways. So make sure you're looking for variant spellings. Browse the city directory. Don't just type in a name and go to that page. Look through it. Look for those misspelled names. Look for those extras. Look for those family members who are living nearby. I put together a spreadsheet when I'm working with city directories, and I usually go five or six years on either direction before or after if I'm looking for an address because I want to catch who's before them and who's after them. Is it grandma's house and everybody's moving in and out of the, the second apartment if it's a two flat? Are they cousins? Are they neighbors? Are they the same denomination? Are they the same nationality? Are they the same occupation? And maybe it's an apprentice who's who apprentices who are moving in and out of um, their boss's extra apartment. We want to look for all of those things. You definitely want to be investigating occupations. The beauty of city directories is that they'll often give you, like if a student, if it's a child who's in school, it might say student or master. Master is just another word for student. Sometimes they'll give you the name of the wife. Sometimes if the husband dies, they'll give you the name of her and have her listed as widow. But you're looking for, you're casting a wider net. City directories are really the best place to go and look for street name and street address changes. So in this particular directory for the city of Juliet, the city renumbered in 1931, and it gives me the new numbers on the left-hand side and the original numbers on the inside. That is a huge address change to go from 109 and a half to 813. If I'm using Google Street View and I'm driving down Cora Street and I'm looking for 109 and a half, I'm in the complete wrong place. I need to know that there was a street name or street address change that happened at that time. And there are places where you can find that. Always reach out to obviously your local libraries because they're going to know right away the historian or the town historian is going to know 
when that date change happened. Um, but there's also some guides online. Um, Rick Steves, uh, not Rick Steves, um, Stephen Morris has a beautiful list of street name and street addresses change for the entire country. So whether it's Danville, Illinois, or New Orleans, or Indianapolis, or whatever it happens to be, they've got a guide to kind of walk you through those changes. But outside of people, outside of your individual ancestor, all of the different things that the city directory offers you. If your ancestor died in 1849, looking at a 1949 phone book for cemeteries isn't going to do you any good because I can guarantee you there's 10 times more cemeteries in 1949 than in 1849. You want to be using records pertinent to the time period that you're researching. And this is absolutely 100% true with city directories, but it's also 100% true with maps. If I'm looking for a community like Albion, Iowa, doesn't exist anymore in the 21st century because when the railroad folded, the town folded. I need to be looking for Albion on maps from 1868, not 1968. Same thing with city directories. Things like doctors, churches, cemeteries, orphanages, asylums and hospitals, things like photographers, right? We have these boxes of photos that have photographers' marks on them. City directories are going to tell me how long that photographer was in business and at that same address. Photographers move. Addresses change. And you can track all of that in the city directory. Things like schools, right? Things like um, clubs, secret societies. They're not so secret when they tell you the Masonic Lodge is on the second floor of the Opera House building. Secret societies are listed in there. And what's beautiful about secret societies and clubs is it's typically giving me the lodge, the club, or the post number. So if I know I had a, a family member who was a member of the Grand Army of the Republic, there might be three Grand Army of the Republic posts in that particular city. How do I find which one's mine? Which one's closest to the house, most likely, or which one's closest to their job? I'm going to take that post number and go look for those records or Masonic Lodge number or International Order Odd Fellows, whatever it happens to be. Take that post number, or that lodge number that's listed in the city directory and go looking for records. I showed you the example of Cora before. Every city directory has a street index and street directory as well. Don't just look for the names alphabetically. Don't just look for John Smith. Don't just look for George Middleton. Don't just look for, you know, Timothy Jones. Look at the street addresses. Who else is at that address? Who else is near that address? What else is going on? Is it an apartment building? Is it a two flat? Is it a, an individual home? Is there a business on the ground floor? All of that's going to come out of the city directory as well. And like I said, streets change names. I can go through the directory and find out where the name changes are. It's telling me, you know, what the addresses are per block. If it changes names at the 1600 block, it's giving me that information. So you definitely want to make sure you're not just looking for your individual name, but you're really researching the community. What type of government offices were they? What buildings were they in? Where was the local church? Where was the hospital? You know, where was the school in proximity to where my family was living? There's lots of city directories available online. You can access them through Ancestry. Fold3 has a good large city collection available online, um, mostly mid-tier to larger. So it's going to have New York, Chicago, Milwaukee, Miami, but it's not going to have things like um, smaller cities like it has. St. Louis, but it doesn't have Kansas City, like it has um, Milwaukee, but it doesn't have Green Bay. So those kinds of things. Internet Archives has some. A lot of states are starting to put them into their um, memory collections, Virginia memory, Iowa memory, Florida memory. Those projects are starting to put city directories online as well. Not in your, in your handout, but again, Library of Congress has a huge city directory collection and phone directory collection available online. Just do a Google search for Library of Congress city directories. It's going to take you right to it. Um, very large collection as well. Now, county histories and gazetteers, we've used these. We know that county histories need to be taken with a grain of salt. We know that there was nobody who was verifying the information that you were providing. I could say I'm a descendant from Queen of Sheba, there was nobody who was going to tell me that I wasn't, as long as I paid my $80 to get my information put in the book. 
But there are really useful things that appear in county histories that we're not always aware of. Yes, I can get the biography about my ancestor. It can make that link from me back to my Revolutionary War ancestor. But what about things like tax lists? What about things like business directories and in inventories of prominent citizens, illustrations and photographs of prominent businesses and government buildings and churches and schools within the community. That's all an important part of my research as well. You know, if my if my parents attended the Frost School and there's a photo of the Frost School from that period, it's important to my research to know that this is what it looked like when my parents attended school there. Gazetteers are a little different in the fact that it's like a city directory, only it's not a single community, it's a county or a geographic area. So for example, there are Illinois gazetteers when um, Illinois was a very small fledgling state. So 1830, 31, 32, 35, there are statewide gazetteers, which lists businesses and in, in, in prominent government offices and schools and churches for the entire state. There are some that are done by county. There are some that some that are done by region. So when you can't find a city directory, change your terminology. Do a search on gazetteers and see what comes up as well. You might be surprised. But gazetteers are also used when they refer to railroads. So those railroad timetables, all of the stops, all of the information about the cities along that particular Burlington line or that particular Ohio line. Those are called gazetteers as well. I'm going to show you an example of one of those in just a minute. But they're going to give you demographic info. How many churches? How many cemeteries? How many schools? How close are they to the next big town? You know, what's their largest industry? When was that industry founded? What does it make? All of that stuff's important. Here's a couple of examples. In Winnebago County in Illinois, it's listing not only our local business owners, um, but it's also talking about their home address as well as their business address. It's telling me that Mr. Molthrope is a dealer in dry goods, that his residence um, on State Street where he's born. So it's giving me all of that kind of demographic information, but then it's giving me information on his business as well. Like it's telling me that Richard Montague is a retired farmer. He now lives in town on Main Street, tells me where he's from, tells me that for many years he was involved in the clothing business. So it's giving me other clues to go and look for. In Kansas, there's, their biographies include photos that go along with them of prominent people. So if that's your ancestor, like John William Johnson is, is one of my ancestors, um, it's giving me a biography as well as a photo. Some of the best ones tell me about the community itself and about what they do. So if I'm trying to figure out if a newspaper ever existed in that community for the time period that I'm looking for, I'm looking in the county history. Because for like this example, it tells me that the very first newspaper was the Rock River Express, and it was it was um, founded in 1840. And it's telling me about every single newspaper that followed. So if I'm going into Chronicling, Chronicling America, also available through Library of Congress, or I'm looking at the National Digital um, Newspaper Project um, to find out if a paper exists, this is telling me what I'm looking for. And it's giving me the date ranges of when they were in business. So Outside of that, I'm going to look for this biography about John Smith, all of these other extra things that are helping me do deeper research. Now I know I'm going to go look for the Rockton Gazette because it was founded in 1857 and I might have had family there in 1859. That's going to be a paper I'm going to hone in on and see if I can find it. So lots of stuff in there. When the first school was established, who the first school marm was, who was the superintendent? When was the first blacksmith or livery stable open? What nationalities arrived there first? What indigenous peoples were there before them? And what happened to these communities? All of that is an important part of the story. Military records, bar none. City, um, county histories were very popular right after the end of the Civil War, celebrating the first centennial of the United States. So a lot of these are talking about war service of recent soldiers and sailors and nurses, and they're tying them back through biographies back to their Revolutionary War ancestor who served as well. That's no different in the 20th century. You have a batch of county histories done 
1870s, 1880s, there's another rash of county histories that are done right after the end of the First World War in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Again, same things, talking about their soldiers and their sailors and their nurses. They're talking about their veterans and what they experienced. So if I'm doing research on the Offerman family, they're going to tell me that three of their sons had all served in the military. You know, one had died, one stayed stateside, and another one had gone overseas to France and was gassed during the service, right? So all of that is information I'm now going to take back and look for additional records. And all of it came out of the local county history. Here's a couple of examples of those railway gazetteers that I talked about. Um, this one is the Spartanburg and Union Railroad. This one ran through South Carolina. Um, it tells me about the communities that were on the line, how much it costs, when the train was due to arrive, how long it would take to get between stations. All of this is amazing stuff if you know that your family traveled between Spartanburg, South Carolina, and Simpsonville, which is where I had family. So I can follow the progress that, you know, it was 23 miles, you know, that the, the fare was going to be $4. Here's what time the train would arrive. But it's also telling me about the community. It's telling me that Spartanburg is the capital of the Spartanburg district and that the town has some fine buildings, you know, that the there's a college in town and it's giving me some additional details. I talked about Albion, Iowa and about how when the railroad folded, it folded. Here's a gazetteer of railway stations. It's showing me all of the communities alphabetically. You can see these aren't just all in Iowa, Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, Virginia. This is national, Arkansas, Kentucky, New York, and the railway line that was on it. So if I look through this list and I see that in um, Alden, it's in the county of Erie in New York, and that it's on the Erie Railway. Or I'm looking at Alfred, which is in York, it's in on the Portland and Rochester Railway, and it's it's giving me the information I need to dig deeper. And these gazetteers are wonderful. A lot of them are digitized and available through a handful of different sources. I'll talk about those at the very end. But if you've not kind of glanced through railway gazetteers, you're missing a great opportunity. Here's another one. This one's Gazetteer of Towns. This one's Montgomery County, New York. I had family who were in Amsterdam, and it's telling me all about the businesses that were established in Amsterdam. Now, the people in my family, they were, weaver. they were weavers. They were Scots who came to New York and then eventually came to Illinois, um, and they were carpet weavers. And it tells me all about the different mills that were in town that were employing a variety of different family members, but then it's also telling me about the churches, it's telling me about the schools, it's telling me about the government offices. So I can see that the Presbyterian Congregation of Amsterdam Village begins in 1832. I can contact them for information. They had 300 members, right? So all of that stuff I can use in my research. St. Mary's Catholic Church, 1844, 600 members. So if I'm that denomination, and I know I had family in that community at that time, looking online at Google now for all the Presbyterian churches wouldn't do me any good. I need to be looking here for the Presbyterian churches that were there in 1869 and 70 before the family left. These are the kind of resources that I'm going to use. Where am I going to go? Readily available online. Again, Library of Congress, Google Books, Hathi Trust, um, Family Search has them. Almost every state has them available through their digital archives, through their memory projects. So they're readily available just doing a search for them. Should have no trouble at all finding them. Things like high school and college yearbooks also. There's some things in yearbooks that you didn't even know existed. And if you didn't know to look for them, if you didn't know what you didn't know, it would be a resource that you wouldn't be taking advantage of. So yes. I can look for my mother's class photo, absolutely. But there's so much more in there. There's business advertisements to local businesses who bought ads every year. You know, so if I had an ancestor who owned a dry cleaners, I'm going to find those ads, maybe even with a photo of the interior or exterior of the building. They loved to talk about their um, military servicemen and women from their graduating classes that were serving overseas. Those show up in the yearbooks as well. Memorials to students or teachers who pass away suddenly. Those are in the yearbook. And not to mention just random photos of the town and the school that you can use to your advantage as well. So in this photo in the bottom left-hand corner, my mom is third from the bottom on the left. She's wearing the black sweater with like the, the um, 
boxed shirt. I pulled this up and I said, oh, look, mom, I found your you know, high school yearbook. And she was like, I am way too young for my high school yearbooks to be appearing online. And at the time I said, mom, you realize you're 75, right? And she was like, oh, okay, well, never mind then. My high school yearbooks are available online. But sometimes you get lucky and you find the most amazing things. So in my community, the high school yearbook includes photos of kids from first grade to 12th grade. So yes, it's listed as the Plainfield High School yearbook, but I am getting one through 12. And up until 1953, when they started kindergarten classes in 53, then I started getting K through 12 photos. So I can follow a child from kindergarten all the way through graduation just by looking at the high school yearbooks. In the community next to us, Joliet Township High School also included the photos for Joliet Junior College as well. So this, you know, lovely young lady that I circled is definitely a senior, but she's not a senior in high school. She is definitely a senior. So you're going to find people from practically birth to death that are going to show up in these yearbooks if you know to look for them. Like I said, business photos, interior and exterior photos of businesses are going to be available. You're going to find military information as well. This is one of my absolute favorite finds. This one comes from the Turner High School yearbook in Kansas City. Class of 1946, Lorraine Craig, James Hugh Craig's younger sister, is a senior. She's graduating. Her, her brother is serving in the Navy, in the military. She decides she's going to include his information in the yearbook about soldiers and sailors who are serving. Look at all this information. Tells me his rank, tells me where he is, tells me when he enlisted, tells me that he's been in the hospital, you know, that he'd been stationed in the Panama Canal, all good stuff that I can use to go find his military record. But that's not what I love most about this. James H. Craig is listed as being the class of 1940. Absolutely, 100%. He did graduate with the class of 1940, but he never graduated from Turner High School. He graduated from a different high school across town. He's included in this yearbook because his sister is included in this yearbook. He never even went to this school, but he shows up in this yearbook because she made sure that he was included. Sometimes amazing things can be found. Again, in memoriams, this young man passed away in 1910, I believe. It's giving me information about who he was as a person, you know, the classes that he had attended, what his likes and dislikes and things like that, where it's not uncommon to find these. So if you're struggling to find an obit for somebody who's young and passes away, look in the yearbooks. See if they memorialize them in a yearbook in the next yearbook. There's also alumni directories as well as alumni lists at the end and back of yearbooks as well for high school and college. This one happens to come from Nebraska State University, gives me the current students as well as all of the people who have graduated from Nebraska State University as well. Some additional resources you might be familiar with, definitely take advantage of things like the Two America series, which are ships manifest lists for Germans and Italians and Irish. Um, they're going to give you inventories. They're going to list the name of the ship. They're going to list the date. And then it's your job to go looking for these records through National Archives or Ancestry or Family Search or wherever you're going to look. Don't overlook the usefulness of encyclopedias, dictionaries, and guides, right? Something like Ada Zacks, which is talking about surnames or how our ancestors died, which are going to tell me that consumption and tuberculosis um, and dropsy are all the same disease. They're just called different things throughout the years. If you see on a baby's death certificate that they died of marasmus, it basically means that they starved because they couldn't nurse. So that explains this for me so that I understand what I'm looking at. The encyclopedias of names, surnames, and, and, and given name directories are all useful. Occupational encyclopedias and directories, all of these are things that are really useful to helping you understand what it is you're, you're finding in these records. We talked a little bit about county histories. I mentioned atlases and plat books. When I talked about maps, I was referring to these as well. These are usually done every decade. You can find them within your communities that are going to show you the, the farms within your community. They're going to show you the layout of towns along with the, the names of the, the subdivisions in the neighborhoods. So it might be the assessor subdivision, the original town, 
Johnson's edition, Bartlett's edition. So if you have property records that reference Bartlett's edition, you have a visual of what that entails. They also include information like I showed you in the county histories about military engagements, things like railroad timetables and things like that as well. Take advantage of those that came before us. Look at genealogical historical society quarterlies and newsletters. A lot of times they had queries pages where people were writing and asking for information about ancestors, or they're doing headstone readings, or they're doing city directory inventories, or they're doing voter lists. If these records aren't online and you can't find them now, but you can find an index to them in a local genealogical or historical society quarter, quarterly, by all means, utilize those. To kind of give you an example, like if you go into Internet Archive and you browse the collections, there are two JSTOR collections that are in Internet Archive. And JSTOR is for academic and peer-reviewed journals and magazines. So I can go in and I can look through early JSTOR, digitized JSTOR issues from the turn of the 20th century, right, when Daughters of the American Revolution and these lineage societies are going into communities and they're indexing and inventorying cemeteries and veterans lists and voter lists and all of these types of records. Those headstones might not exist in the 21st century. They might have fallen apart. They might have been damaged. They might have just been lost to time. But there's an inventory to them that's done in 1919 or 1899 or 1935 under the Works Progress Administration. Use those. Look for those. Look for in historical societies um, references to communities, to schools, to cemeteries and see what comes up really, really good information that we don't have to reinvent because we're taking advantage of those records from those people who came before us. Lineage societies are a great resource as well, whether it's the daughters of the American Revolution, the sons of the American Revolution, the sons of the Confederacy, the um, sons of Cincinnati, the daughters of Civil War soldiers, whatever it happens to be. They're going to be able to help you and provide information. And if you're lucky enough, like with the DAR, they have a very robust library and online presence to help answer your questions and help um, continue your research. Lots and lots and lots of organizations out there. Lots of things like colonial dames, like colonial um, sheriffs and officers, lots of different types of groups. If you can think of, of a group, it probably exists. It's probably out there. Like I said, Daughters of the American Revolution has one of the best um, search engines and biggest libraries out there, but they're not the only ones. There are other organizations that can help you in your research. Sons of the Spanish-American War, I have an ancestor, August Schaefer, who had served, had no idea where he was buried. My mom couldn't remember. My grandparents were gone. The Sons of the Spanish-American War did an inventory of Spanish-American War soldier headstones, and I did a search, and sure enough, there he was. And all I had to do was look for it. So if you suspect somebody could have been a member of a group like the Grand Army of the Republic or the Sons of the Confederacy, you can reach out to these groups for copies of those records. Modern records, Veterans of Foreign Wars, the VFW, the American Legion, which began in 1918 immediately um, at the end of the war. They have records. In order to join a military organization, you have to have served. So you would have had to have provided them your, your military service. So if you're stuck on a military ancestor and you don't have any details about where or how they served, contact the local service, military service organizations and see if they were ever members. They might have exactly what you're looking for. Royal lineage societies. Oh, how badly do I want to be a descendant of, you know, the National Society of Saints and Sinners or descendants of illegitimate sons and daughters of the kings of Britain, that would be wonderful. My mom's maiden name is Middleton. Yes, Middleton, that Middleton. So hopefully, eventually, we can find the connection to the royal family that uh, would be a lot of fun to be able to, to suss out. Last thing I want to talk about is interlibrary loan. You are librarians and you are library patrons. 
you are logged in today from your library to learn about resources, take advantage of all of the things that your library has to offer. Utilize WorldCAD, see what's available out there to potentially borrow through interlibrary loan, or see what types of records are already digitized and available for you online. We have access to materials anywhere within the continental United States. So if I needed, like at one point when I worked at University of Chicago, I borrowed a, a 1845 Albany City directory, and they sent it to me. Cornell University put it in the mail and sent it to me at U, uh, U, of, U of C. You have access to a world of information that you should be taking advantage of. So reach out to your library. We can get microfilm. We can even borrow things from the Library of Congress. Um, there are some restrictions. We cannot borrow genealogy. We cannot borrow things that are in special collections unless it's Cornell, because Cornell will lend, <coughs> excuse me, things, things within their special collections to an extent. Um, but university libraries are typically your best bet because they are there to promote history. They're not there to collect genealogy. So usually if you can find a university library that has it, they're going to be more willing to lend it. The problem is it has to stay in house. So you'd have to utilize it at your local library. Fine, for me to get my hands on a directory from 1845, I'm happy to do so. You can go to WorldCat yourself. Just go to WorldCat, you know, just do a search on WorldCat. It's gonna take you to the page. I did a search on Ayrshire history because I have family in Ayrshire, Scotland. And you can see in the records, it tells me that there are already digitized copies already available for me to view. I don't have to request it through interlibrary loan. All I have to do is click on that link and download that book and read it from the comfort of my home. It tells me there are a variety of volumes. There's volume one and volume two. One was done by Harvard. The other was done by University of Michigan. Look at both. One might have been done in black and white. The other one might have been done in color. You might get a better copy from one institution versus another. So look at them both and download the one that looks best for you. If it's not available online, it'll tell you where a print version is available and it'll rank it by closest library to you to farthest library from you. Other digital book collections that are available online, Digital Public Library of America, if you're not taking advantage of that. I belong, we have a collection in Ida, Illinois, which is the Illinois Digital Archive. It's sponsored by the State Library and the State Archives. Libraries and museums across Illinois digitize records and make them available through Ida, Illinois. Ida, Illinois also has their collection in WorldCat, so you would find my material listed in WorldCat, but we also supply copies of our material to DPLA. So New York Public Library Digital Collection, same thing shows up in DPLA as well, so that there are more people who have access to it than just the people who are gonna stumble across Ida, Illinois. Other good places to look, Hathi Trust, Family Search has a really robust collection of historical society and genealogical society journals and, and like family newsletters that are already digitized and scanned through the book collection within Family Search. So if you're looking for modern things, 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, Family Search is the place to go. They've digitized these and made them available online. If it's older than that, I'm looking in Hathi Trust, Google Books, Internet Archive, which I had already mentioned earlier, DPLA. So I'm going to turn my camera back on. I apologize. I think I ran over by a couple of minutes there. Um, but hopefully you have some new ideas, some new ways at looking at things that you might not have necessarily tried before. Um, and if so, Great. If not, share share with all of us your suggestions and your resources. What's your favorite go-to? I would love to hear um, what some of your favorite resources are that I might not have mentioned. <clears throat> I apologize. My chair squeaks. Oh, my gosh, Tina, that was wonderful. Um, so much information. Uh, Helen didn't receive her handout, so um, Helen gave me her email. If you didn't receive it, please drop your email down in the chat, and I'll make sure that you get it. I'll just see. Let's take a look and what questions. Mary had a question um, when you talked about roads earlier. She wanted mm -hmm. to know, where would you look for names of men who worked on roads? Typically, whatever the, the governing body was that was, was responsible for it. So in my area, the township was responsible 
and they would hire workers. So in the township office, usually either in the assessor's office or in the, the minutes for the board, they would have to keep an account of everybody, all, all of their funds. So you're looking for the fund books. You're looking for the accountants books that are showing you all the money coming in and going out. So all the people who paid their water bill, all the people they hired to pave the road, like it's a two-way street. So if I had somebody who was coming in once a year and they were paying their dog license to have their dog, that would have to be registered as income in the township books or in the city book, you know, Plainfield Township, the farms on the outside of the community, Plainfield Village, right, would be collecting that same information for those people who are living in town, right? And they're going to talk about their employees who are cleaning the roads, cutting the grass, killing the dandelions, you know, catching the dogs, as well as all of the people who are then paying, you know, their business licenses and their liquor licenses and their real estate taxes and everything else that goes along with it. But absolutely, the road and bridge books are an early, really good resource for when you're doing early, like rural uh, research on people who are living outside of urban areas, because those roads are all named after those families who live there. So, for example, in our area, there's Heggs Road, there's Bruce Road, there's Stewart Road, right? There's Gilmore Road. Those are all the farms. Those are all the Gilmore Farm, the Stewart Farm, the Bruce Farm. Right. And they were paying money towards having those roads graded and taken care of every year, because if you can't get your goods, you can't get your crops to town to sell, then you can't make any money. So those are really early records because money is changing hands. Um, so they're a great resource for finding people before a census, before an every name census in 1850. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, those accountant books, those those budgets and those logs. Have I found a lot of ancestors listed because in in our community in Illinois, every able-bodied man had to give one day of service to the township every year. So every year I can see what they did. So I can see, okay, you know, Andrew Craig and his sons, you know, John and William and Albert all had to do some kind of work, right? One's cutting weeds, two are are paving and grading the road. You know, the other one is doing something different but it was required once a year for all of the men to give one full day of service and they weren't paid for it. That was like their, their dues. Like that was mm. their agreement. That's so interesting. Now, when you mentioned that, I just remember that I have a lot of account ledger books um, mm -hmm. in the archives. So people are bartering with each other. Um, mm -hmm. They could be bartering, you know, purchasing of goods, but also uh, bartering services as well. And that would never show up anywhere <laughs> else. So exactly. ledger books. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. I have never heard of moving day. That was, that was great. And I would never have thought about looking up nicknames. So, and so that was wonderful. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Feel free to um, unmute yourself or drop your questions. I have a lot of um, thank yous and appreciations. You're welcome. You have my email address on the handout too. So as you're going through it, if something comes to mind and you think, oh, I didn't think to ask for that, you can always send me an email as well. Or if you're looking for a particular area in the country and you want to know what types of records are available, I can easily get you that information as well. Oh, that's great. Um, I have Bridget who says, thank you so much, Tina. So comprehensive. My dad um, it, from 1901, 1962, played basketball and football at Menasha, Wisconsin High School, the other Winnebago County, and tennis locally after that. And it was great to find him in newspapers and earbooks in recent years. Um, he died when I was two. Uh, small town descriptions of visitors were interesting too. His mom was Kitty too. Great. Oh, Bridget, thank you for sharing that. I'm so glad you were sharing that information with us. That's really interesting. It sounds like you had a pretty full life. Um, I never thought about looking up um, college yearbooks. Is that a uh, would you do colleges um, publish those? Like, are they digitized? Have you found a lot of them to be? The, the most robust collection of college 
in university yearbooks that I found was through my heritage. They used to be okay. through World Vital Records. If you remember when World Vital Records was a thing, they got bought out by my heritage. So that collection got rolled into it. Mm -hmm. But whether you're a Jayhawker or a corn husker, like they've got these these yearbooks. Um, but if you go into places like Internet Archive and you do a search, the earlier you go. Mm -hmm. So in the 20th century, we call them yearbooks, but traditionally they called them annuals. So mm -hmm. you want to be looking for the term annual if you're looking before roughly 1910, but you'll find things like college yearbooks, you'll find nursing college yearbooks in there, you'll find, mm -hmm. you know, doctors, universities in there, like Rush Medical College is going to be listed in there, you're going to find all kinds of different yearbooks, high school yearbooks as well. Um, so Internet, Internet Archive has a huge collection as well. But sometimes just doing a Google search to see. So sometimes you need to know the name of the yearbook. So if somebody went to University of Illinois in Champaign, it's called the ILIO. So I would look for ILIO annual and it would take it to me. But if I searched for University of Illinois, I would come up with it too. In Illinois, we have a college consortium that's called CARLI, C-A-R-L-I-E-L-I. -E it's Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries of Illinois. Um, you'll find it in Internet Archive. It's one of those collections under American Libraries. Mm -hmm, you can find it through WorldCat. There's a lot of way to find it. Um, but in Carly, for example, there are lots of colleges with their yearbooks digitized and available in there. So whether it's, you know, University of Illinois Circle Campus, um, whether it's Governor State University, whether it's Illinois Wesleyan, they're digitized and they're available in there. So college yearbooks are really readily available. Now, keep in mind, it's not always about the graduate. Some people might have only have gone for a year or two. They're still going to be represented in that, even if they never actually graduated. So it's worth taking a look. And when you're looking in the 19th century, when you're looking 1860s, 70s, 80s, look for the college annual itself. So something like um, Sims College annual or... Um, Presbyterians did this a lot too. Monmouth College Annual. And it's going to give you information about the college, the courses that were offered. It's going to tell you who the professors and the teachers are, but they also list students in it as well. Wow. Amazing. Hey, well, Tina, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to end the recording here.